Um, I, I'm really excited that there's like more than 100 people in a room in Switzerland that are doing Python because this is really not like what I know and do usually. Like I've done like two years of open source work now and it's been mostly in my room <laughs> and on the balcony. So um, that was different. It was just me and not like 100 people. So I, I didn't even expect that there's so many Pythonistas around here. And some of you might have come from further away, um, but still. Um, as, as I said, I've, I've done um, mostly open source work in the last two years. And then I, I went to Afghanistan with an NGO um, doing some computer work as well. Um, so I created Jedi and Jedi Vim. Who, who knows Jedi? Maybe, maybe. Okay, so like a few of you. Um, Jedi is, a, is a, an auto-completion library. It's, um, it, it has grown quite a bit. It's like, like 2,000 stars on GitHub. Jedi Vim is, is just an implementation of it. So you can use, um, if you don't use PyCharm, like the best way to get auto-completion is Jedi. There's like plugins for Emacs and Vim and all the other um, editors that you shouldn't use. <laughs> um, oh, too fast. Um, what I what I really started to like when when I when I wrote Jedi is is I like writing clean code. I like writing good code, and it's mostly not possible because I I suck at it. Um, but when I when when I start to refactor things, things get cleaner and like. Um, I also started to think a lot about what I'm doing. Like I I started to think a lot about the API and like also class design. So this has helped, but still like Jedi kind of sucks even after refactoring or especially the API. Some, some things about it are just not that good. And this talk is inspired also by um, Raymond Hettinger and his talk and Alex Martelli. Like especially the first talk, API design lessons learned is, is a really good talk. You can look it up. Um, don't take the YouTube version, there's another version online. It's it's a really good talk because it it, um, it explains a lot about how standard library uh, stuff grew and what is good about standard library stuff and what is not so good. Um, so let's start. Um, there's like if you want to write good code, there's there's like few things you can do. There's you can you can think like you you write clean code, you do good architecture like good API design. You do testing. Who here uses PyTest and Tox? Okay, like that's way too few. Like, <laughs> like, y y like just, I, I don't know if there's a talk today about this. I, I don't think so. So, there is? Okay, so, so this is good. This is actually really good. Yeah, you, like you, you really should be using those two um, to test your stuff. If you don't test at all, like, yeah, go to this talk. <laughs> this man is saving your life. Um, and then there's also documentation, uh, which is really important. And there's a really good tool as well for this. It's called Sphinx in Python. Also use this. Um, you're not doing yourself a favor if you don't. I can understand if you don't use it for a web project or something, but still, like it, even even in those cases, it might have, um, like it might be really good. Um, code reviews are something else that that can improve your code drastically. The problem is that, like I 
control pull requests myself, but nobody co controls what I kind of push. So that's where where I sometimes suck. Like you cannot, or you cannot be controlled in a company where you're the only developer, or you're like two developers and one is like the, the intern. <laughs> so API stands for application programming program or programming interface it like that is not really important we will just be talking about interfaces in general like so in in python what would you say are there interfaces who says yes who says no nobody says okay like, there are kind of interfaces, like, you can use ABC, ABC Meta. It's something that almost nobody uses. Um, but it's really, like, if you want contract-style interfaces, it's, it's what you can use. They're, like, as I said, it, it, a lot of people don't use them because you don't need them. Like Python is is mostly duck time, and but they're still great for certain usages. So if you haven't seen it yet, um, it, it might be worth looking at it, especially if you're not a total beginner. Then let's start about talking about bad APIs. Um, the, the worst API you can have is having no API at all. Like, because the thing is, you still have an interface. You still have something that interacts with the world. And if you interact with the world, it can be like an image or a website, but like, you, you're still out there and sub like some programmer can read it. Like my father, who's not even a programmer, he tries like, he tries to read wind data from an image. Like he just has image analysis and stuff because he wants this data. So there's like, there's still an interface. Like you can read this, or you can get it somehow, unless it's like scrambled text, and, but even then. Um, the second one is like, you can go for both solutions. Like one of the things a lot of people do is like, okay, like I have this idea and I have the other idea. And then I, yeah, like one developer uses this one and one wants this one. So I'm just gonna do both. So in Jedi, for example, there's this command na names that lists all the names in a, in a, in a Python source file. Like you could have, on the first one and the second one. Because like, script, you don't know what script is, but script pretty much is just a, a like in Jedi, like that's perfectly reasonable. But what I decided is to do not the, not the second one and only the first one. For some other things, there's only the second one, like calls on script, because it makes sense there. I, I will not explain the, like, the whole API, but so never, like, this should not be possible. You should be able to call it one way and one way only. Like, this is the Python philosophy. We're not talking Perl here. Like, <laughs> um, so there's, there's, like, one way. The, Third thing is inconsistency. Um, so there's not just like like standard violations and and this kind of stuff, but mostly it's about deciding to go with like overnaming all of our all our API in a certain way. But then, like, we're doing exception here. You shouldn't be doing exceptions. Like, it should be very consistent. For for Jedi, for example, we decided to go with 
with nouns like completions and go to defin like go to and whatever uh, go to underscore definitions and while you don't know these words the the point is um you go with nouns and then you go with nouns everywhere like so this is consistency and at this point like <laughs> one of the things i realized when i when i yesterday like when i went to sleep yesterday is that you're probably like most of you are probably not doing apis because like apis is only something you do when you write a library but a library is something like almost nobody writes like open source people write libraries but then again like consistency um good api design and like all of the stuff i just spoke about is very important for the casual pro programmer as well because you're going to design classes at least like if you don't design class if you just do, do like very simple Django stuff and are mostly on the on the HTML side. It doesn't mean like if you do Django, you're you're doing simple stuff. But just like if you, like there's there's these websites that like it's just like return one plus one and okay that's that's like all my coding. So if you do that, you might not be doing classes. But once you're doing classes, this stuff gets kind of important because you're designing and you have an internal API at least like this this you still have an interface that you work against when you have a class so to get back to um, inconsistencies like there's a consistency that I think is kind of important in Python and it's called PEP8 most open source projects follow this standard you can violate it in certain ways like if you think that tabs are better in spaces yeah okay but be consistent like use tabs then <laughs> um in general what i would not be doing is like this kind of java style because almost nobody does it in python you're doing python don't do Java. If you do Java, like write it like this. But if 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 you do it in Python, it's just yeah. There's there's in in some other world very very far away, a little puppy will die because you do this. <laughs> it's just it's not fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but still like, it doesn't mean that your 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 whole API sucks like beautiful soup for I don't know who knows it but it's 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 it was it's a good library and they changed their naming convention to uh, to a more Pythonic way but beautiful soup 3 was still a really good library and the API was great nobody nobody complains about that it's just it wasn't a standard of Python. Okay. So when you, but let's 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 now move more to to the solution side. Um, you have to brainstorm your API in in general. When you when you start, even when you start writing a class, think beforehand about what this class is going to do and what it's not going to do and think about what you need outside and what you don't need so all the stuff you need is going to have um, normal names and all the stuff you don't need is going to have scores um, that have an underscore prefix out on the outside from the uh, from the outside view I'm, I'm going to talk more about that underscore stuff later um, when you when you do that think about data types like API API API's should have very simple data types this is uh, something from PEP 20 
PEPs, by the way, for those who don't know it, uh, they're, they're Python enhancement proposals, and they're a way of driving Python. Um, like Python is, u is mostly defined by PEPs. So, PEP 20 is the sen of Python. It's just like sentences like simple is better than complex and beautiful is better than ugly. So this is just one of them. Simple is better than complex. Like if you can return a, an integer to a very simple question like get line number, return an integer. Don't return a class that does something crazy. So this like like the same is 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 probably true for i o i o should should be like especially in apis don't don't use pickle because no other language can read that it's just a python thing so if you need to serialize something in python and you read it again that's for kind of internal state like i do that myself but that's for like some crazy parser state that's great but it's not for communicating with the outside world. And you might think, oh yeah, I just need it for Python processes, but then like some other guy comes along and he uses it differently. Um, one thing you also have to factor in in your thoughts when you when you think about designing classes is performance. And I like I think optimizing for performance, especially in API design, is very dangerous because you you tend to kill your API in, in one way or the other. But there's like there's a a new async way of like Python 3.5 introduced async support for the language. So this, for example, might be a very good way of of having of, of doing API design with async with with an as asynchronous thinking. Um, but that's not true for all the previous ver versions. So think about that. Like asynchronous is great if you need it if you need it for performance. But usually you don't. But just think about that. There's maybe like if there's a one second delay or two second because of your API, well, you might need to do asynchronous. Okay. And this <laughs> this is really important. You should be conservative in your API decisions. Um, if if there's one thing you should learn from my talk is just this like don't make things public that shouldn't be public because you're gonna regret it i regretted it like like i still do this and like mostly when pull requests comes up come up and like people say oh we like this would be such a nice feature i say like, Okay, but are you sure that this is the only way of doing it? And like, am I sure? And if I'm not, I, I just, I don't merge. Because when, you, when you're not conservative, when you, when you just add to the API on and on, you will have to maintain it. And that sucks. <laughs> like, uh, like, I have like, like even when doing just open source work, like this bug tracker eats so much of my time. And I don't think paid customers are better than open source developers. <laughs> so yeah, I, I guess in, in, in general, if you just keep it down a bit and like you just say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go with the temptation of this nice feature. I'm just going to have my four old boring calls, my four old functions, and they're great, and I'm going to improve 
the inside first, and once that is really good, I'm gonna make something new. Okay. This just fits right in. Um, if for anybody that, that doesn't know about this convention, it's, it's, it's very normal for Python developers to use underscore um, for kind of protected variables or even private. It's kind of a mix because there's no protected and private in Python. But this is how you, how you say this variable should not be accessed from the outside. Just use it all the time. Like if, if you don't need to use it from the outside, it's a really good way to use it. Refactoring support in Python sucks. And so it's even more important than, for example, in Java, I think. Because in, in Java, you could just refactor. In Python, you're refactoring with a tool like Jedi or PyCharm, and you just don't know if it's really right, because it's like, I don't like I don't refactor with my own tool to be honest. Like <laughs> I have a certain re refactoring support and like I'm still not sure if it works really well. So I don't trust my own tools there. <laughs> and that's not that's not very good because my like my tool does refactoring and like it's like one of two tools that do it kind of well. <laughs> so yeah, you choose. <laughs> and there's also underscore underscore variables. And there are they are something kind of different. Uh, I wouldn't recommend using underscore underscore too much because it's really a hack in Python itself. Uh, it's like a hack in the parser. Like Python rewrites underscore underscore to class name underscore underscore name like this and it's it's kind of crazy but in certain at certain points it makes sense so if you really need something private really only for that class and you're not using like get atcher and you're sure you will never use it so for very simple cases, you can use it. But I, I, I would really prefer you use the underscore. Okay. There's there's naming conventions in, in in Python like that I talked about, but there's also kind of naming conventions that most languages use. Like nouns are for attributes, verbs are for methods, but like really nobody wants to wants go get underscore in Python. Like I know where this comes from. It comes from the place where like Java's, uh, Java developers come to Python, but at the same time, get underscore still has like it's still a good thing if you use it carefully if you, like you shouldn't be using using it always but it can be good like but then there's there's like these library like these python libraries and they sometimes use it and they sometimes do and and the only thing like in python that we we really know is that like all the libraries are consistently inconsistent about using get underscore and not using get underscore and using verbs for method and not using verb, verbs for methods. So, for example, requests uses just text f as an attribute and then like JSON as a function. And the problem is in Python, like you might even use the uh, the the, uh, the call di uh, the function dir dir on on that object, and you will see text and JSON. Do you know what it is, like a function or a, a or a noun, a function or an attribute? You don't, and that's 
okay, I guess, because there's documentation and you will find out. But still, like, there, that's something to think about. And I still haven't decided if I'm, like, I'm also consistently inconsistent about this. I also sometimes use uh, nouns um, where for verbs and the other way around, so it's just something you might want to think about for your API or for your classes in general. Um, one other thing in Python that is really nice and that not a lot of people are using are named arguments. So one very simple example is the first one. You will not know what like this Twitter search call is actually doing. It's just a, a false. What what you could write instead is like num underscore results is three retweets equals false, and that's it. Like this is this is way better. And for people that develop exclusively in Python three. I would actually uh, I would actually recommend you to use the star there because that star will not allow people to use a, like like you will have an interface that allows people to use it the old way but n like just if you don't use those uh, keyword parameters like this means you cannot write it like comma three comma false. You can only write it the second way, and you can write it like Twitter search um, brackets some name, but not like like comma three because you yeah. So the star like this is a great addition to Python, and I really recommend recommend you to use it. So let's go over to properties. Properties in APIs is also something that I like. And at the same time, they can be really dangerous. Like property for, for the first kind of function is, is something great. Like it, it's like line number is something I, I never ever want to be different somehow. That's just an integer and I don't want an, an option of like, oh, add like two to it in the API. But if you have something more complicated, like def doc string, like you might, like a doc string, you might want just a raw doc string with all the white space or you might want a like a concatenated, like no, not concatenated. You might want a version that like cuts away white space and all that stuff. So there, a function is better, and like you can start very simple because this function, like if it's a property, you cannot change its signature. If it's not a property, you can change its signature. You can write like def, def doc string self comma has white space equals false. You can add this to it, and if you add it to it, that's that hasn't changed the API at all. Like it, it's still the same old API. It just has a new option. So properties in properties you cannot add options. In functions you can. So think about that when you design your API. And um, this is true as well for people that just do normal classes and that do not APIs because you will not, like when you do it with properties, you might need to refactor all the calls to that function. And if you call it like a hundred times and the refactoring tools suck in Python, you will need to go through your code 100 times, grab for it, search for it, replace like 100 calls and then like, it's just annoying. I've done it. I've been there. <laughs> um, 
so we're slowly getting to the end of the talk and one thing I want to talk about now is, is transitions. Transitions are something that you will not like get away in your API. This is something that is that is different for people that never write an API. API. If you do a transition with your own code, you just refactor. You don't care about the outside world. For an API, this is different. You need you have versioning, and you, you cannot just change uh, your API the way you want. There's like semantic versioning for people that have never heard about it. It's a it's a convention about uh, writing versions. There, is there like well, uh, yeah. Anyway, so there's like. You can you can write versions in in a, in a certain way. Like you can write it like one dot one dot five, and that would be like starting from version one dot x. It's the first non-beta version. Like semantic versioning looks like this. So this is oh this is way too small. This is this is a beta version. This is the this is a minor update in a beta version. This is a major update in a beta version. And if you go to one dot zero dot zero, this is your first version. So semantic versioning can be great for, for like describing your API, but let's say we want to jump from 0.7.1 to 0.8.0. We cannot just change our API because people want to update their software and they, like, they don't want problems because that fills our bug, bug tracker and we don't want to fill bug tracker. <laughs> it, it's not we care about their problems, we care about not a full bug tracker. <laughs> um, so so what you can what, what you can do is is you can deprecate stuff. Like in Python two to three a lot of things even before that were deprecated. Actually if you if you look at it, um, if you start like like you can print warnings with Python um, space dash w all, and uh, w um, is capital letter. And if you do that, you and you start it, you will see a warning in Python two that the module imp is deprecated. So. The same is, is like, but and you can also produce these warnings yourself. You can just say warnings dot warn, and then like some message deprecation warning. This is proper deprecating of stuff in Python. Like you, you write a function, uh, you you add to the function something in the doc, doc string that says, well, this is deprecated. And then you also say warnings.warn, some string deprecation warning. And this is going to be printed in Python if you use it with Python, with the command I just said. Like I can write it down. It's called Python. Uh, all. Okay, like this, like wall. And so what, what, what this is above there in the doc string is like, it says dot dot space deprecated and then a version. This is a call, like it's not a call, but it's, it's a way of telling Sphinx the documentation that this call is deprecated and so 
this is the, a beautiful way of how Python and its ecosystem interacts. Like, this is a good way of telling a user when he reads your code that it's deprecated, but it's also a way of telling the documentation, well, this is, this is not, you shouldn't be using this anymore. And so it displays it. One of the things that I that I realized while 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 developing APIs is that you can get APIs right when you really think about them. Like even in even if you're writing internal tools, like one of the things that that Jeff Bezos did like the the Amazon CEO is he he well like 2002 like a long time ago um he he went to to serve like to service interfaces so like um he started using services only in his company and so I said like anyone who doesn't do this will be fired thank you have a nice day and this is kind of crazy in a way to switch from the old way so drastically but at the same time it allowed them to just because they were doing this it allowed them to just make their um, cloud like to put them in a public space and say well you can use this now because it was always designed to be used by people and to be used by uh, pretty much anyone and not just, it wasn't just like this internal company thing that had like a thousand dependencies everywhere. Like it was designed from day one to be used by a customer. And if the customer is internal, that's fine. If the customer is external, that's also fine. And this is the same for your APIs. You, you don't know who's going to use your code in like five years. But if it's well written, and if it's only that module out there in your hierarchy, like they can take it out. It doesn't have any dependencies. It's good. Like for example, in in, in my library in Jedi, there's a parser, and you could pretty much rip it out, like replace one to a few things, and you're fine because the parser. It's like, it's a parser. It shouldn't be like have some dependencies into code analysis. Loose coupling. <laughs> okay, so let's let's wrap up. Use what you learned in API design for your internal APIs. I've talked about this a lot now. So this is this is really my conclusion. Um, be conservative. Like, don't make things public that shouldn't be public. You can even do this in modules. Like, I, like when I when I define modules, like stuff in modules, I, I like define functions that I don't use outside with an underscore. It's not just uh, classes. Um, and you should be able to go public with a sub package without refactoring. Okay. Oh, this was too fast. Okay, so this was pretty much it. Um, thank you for listening. I'm, I'm working, like I will start to work <laughs> on Tuesday at a company called CloudScale. And this is like the, really the first job in like a long time. <laughs> and um, we're actually hiring still. And so if you want to join us, um, I'm David Halter on GitHub and Jedidia uh, underscore CH on Twitter. So I'm open for questions. So you s uh, you talked about the Java like uh, interface uh, Java like naming thing, uh -huh. and 
I'm wondering, I mean, it's mostly a personal preference, I guess, but how do you think it's best to handle this when using a library like Qt, for example, which is, well, you have two clashing name conventions then with PyQt. You have the Qt name convention, which is the camel case one, and the Python pep8 naming convention. So what I did is having my stuff lowercase and pep8 and having the interfaces to Qt and things I'm overriding, of course, camel case, but I'm wondering what your opinion on this is. Yeah, I mean, I am uh, I have this, the same opinion, like write stuff in PEP, PEP 8 compliant, like don't be extremely picky because then you're just looking at PEP 8 stuff while all the stuff that it actually matters and that is actually hard, like you will just ignore it. But in general, like write PEP 8 software, it's yeah, like why would you why would you care about the library itself? It's just calls to that library, and the function names might look a bit odd. But yeah, thank you. I uh, hello, is it on? Yeah. Uh, okay, um, I wondered if you could say a bit more about long term maintenance of. Um, libraries and APIs because honestly it sounds a bit scary like how much of your life does that take up uh, <laughs> 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 it's okay because I didn't like it if you don't work it's okay <laughs> no I mean to be honest it's it's something that a lot of a lot of people are scared of and also a lot of people get burned out from because it's like it takes probably like now a day and I could probably reduce it to like four or five hours a week but that's that's not improving the software that's not like maintenance that's just bug tracker and like a little bit of bug fixing, like the worst stuff. But yeah, so <laughs> it takes a lot of time. But it's also it's 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 very interesting stuff. So like it's a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> oh, when is when is the best time to start thinking about your API? So you start with with some. Just code on the side where where you have functions for yourself. Then you refactor it to a separate module on your uh, project, and at some point you start having a library for it. So it's kind of fluent. When is the best time to actually sit down and and you know <laughs> design it? Um, I think I think like I think of. Coding as a very like in a in a very agile way, or, or that's how I do it. Like, like you said, like it's just a fluent. It's it's a procedure. Like you ch change things and you iterate, and like that's normal. But when you when you think about an API and when you think about an API, that especially that has to go public, like you cannot change it so easily. So I would really recommend you. Like when you when you when you stand when you're in front of a problem, design your APIs. Mostly, the API is not the complicated thing. Like it's like just write down like just brainstorm and like write down your UML diagrams and whatever or like something similar. I I'm not even capable of writing UML diagrams. So, but, but like like something similar in, in in that kind of way, and you you will. You will see that that tremendously helps. That's that's my take. Thank you. I also have a question. Um, some people recommend that uh, people write the interfaces in the tests first and then start implementing the interfaces or so the test first development. Um, it's yeah. quite hard to do uh, because you need a lot of uh, um, needs a lot of effort to actually do. But uh, would you recommend it? Did you do it in the past? <laughs> It's 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 funny that you would ask that because when when we first met, he uh, like we we worked at a company together, 
and like I was the one writing like 1,000 lines of regex code, like literally just regex calls. <laughs> 1,000 lines, and like I had like zero tests back there. <laughs> so you can imagine the mess. Uh, but like, yeah, writing the tests first can be something that can help. But like, I I don't like writing tests so much. Like, I I like the things about to think about the problems first. It's probably a good discipline. Like. I write tests, like, I do test-driven development, by the way, but writing, like, all the tests first for the API, that's probably going to be hard, and you're not going to pass the tests for a long time, probably. So, I don't know. I like writing incrementally, but thinking about the API first and kind of creating it without actually using all of it in the beginning. Okay, we're out of time, so thank you, Dave, thank you. one more time.